Her work on Good Morning Football was recognized with an Emmy for Outstanding Studio Show in 2022 and is now the host of Up and Adams on FanDuel TV every weekday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. I've been a fan of hers from afar and now have the pleasure to meet her. And welcome on Kay Adams. Kay, thank you so much for being here. Emmy winner, Kay Adams. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> How so crazy I, is that? Finally. We did that show for I, six years and finally got the Emmy. How about that? So well deserved. And it's a shame it took that long, but in the end it happened. Uh, I listed off uh, a few of your many accomplishments, but I I wanted to begin where it all started and rewind a few uh, years back. You were born in Chicago to Polish immigrant parents. Was there anything in in particular about growing up in the Polish culture that kind of shaped you into the person you are today? Oh, probably everything. Um, You know, my attachment to the Polish culture was so significant and it was, uh, I was so involved. It was in the fiber of my being growing up in Chicago, which has this huge Polish American community, Polish community. I spent my Saturdays in Polish school for three hours when I was in high school, my Friday nights in Polish school, learning the language, grammar, learning the history, learning the literature, all the greats. Um, and, and uh, all the great Polish figures throughout history. But I think mostly it's my parents. My parents are from two very small farms, farm villages, I would say, uh, in different sides of Poland. And they had very little. They're the oldest of, um, of big families and took a risk to come to America for a better life. Uh, and they, they grinded it out. And I watched them from a very young age grind it out and work really hardworking jobs. And uh, with very little empathy for not working hard or working as hard as you can work to make things happen. So that sort of work ethic, I th- probably perpetuated me to any sort of level of success uh, and carried me through even when I wasn't as talented maybe as other people. Well, what sparked your interest in media and broadcasting? Was there a singular moment in your life that maybe inspired you? It just always looked fun to me. And when I was really little, I was never afraid of the camera. And we had big, you know, big Polish parties for birthdays and uh, baptisms and all of that. I would be the one that's deciding what my bits were going to be. And I'm going to go into the living room and I'm going to stand on a chair and I'm going to recite this poem or I'm going to sing this song from Beauty and the Beast and I'm going to put on a show. So it was, I was never afraid uh, to be on. And I, I liked being on. I liked performing. And then when you're, you know, you start watching as you're a teenager, like E! News, and you're like, oh, Julianne Rancic, like, I want to do that. She look how cool is that? She just gets to talk to people, get their stories, celebrate them. And um, I always thought it was an easy, fun gig. And that's sort of what I think brought me in that direction. And whenever you, I would even hear people on the radio, I would say, I could do this. And I would say, I, would, I really would. I'd be like, I could do this better. I could do this better right now. That's just sort of the mentality that I had. And I'm actually like not that confident of a person, but th- it's something that I always found confidence in was being able to communicate and being, being able to be on camera. Well, you attended University of Missouri and at Mizzou, you majored in communications. And, I, and we all know communications is the superior degree. Um, after college, how did your media career begin? What what was the first stop that kind of launched your journey? I would say, and, and anybody who might be listening to this and wanting to figure out, like, how do I get where I want to go? You just say yes. You just don't say no to any opportunity that might lead you somewhere. Like, I'm not going to lie to you. Like, some of them were a little sketchy, Michael. Like, I would respond to, like, in St. Louis, like, Craigslist ads of, like, need somebody to do this commercial for something. And I would, you know, show, I wouldn't recommend this to anyone, but I'd show up and they'd be shooting like a carpet commercial that was going to air on like public access TV. I'm like, I'll do it. I'll be in it. Like I want to just be on camera. And so I would just say no to any little opportunity there was. So even in college, um, which, you know, I look back at college and I wish it was more, you know, I I had fun, but I wish it was an easier time. I had to to figure out how am I going to pay for this stuff? I don't, you know, I, I don't have a full ride. I had to get in-state residency at Mizzou so I could afford anything. And I was constantly just trying to work as many hours I could at Willie's Pub and Pool. Or I, I you know, I, I was working in the leasing office where I lived so I could pay for rent that way. And they gave me free rent if I worked 25 hours and anything over that I got paid $8 an hour. So that was really exciting for me. Um, so I, I found a way to get opportunities 
even then, even with like, so that, like the, you know, I, I, I had to work. I had to go to school. I worked more than I went to class. It's just the truth. And I would see an internship opportunity that was like nothing. It was like not even real, but I got one that was like for the CW network or something like that, where it was like me and I met this girl, Carissa, and she's now Carissa Culliner who works for CMT and she's really, you know, incredible and has a, had a great career as well. And we've stayed friends and we would go and we'd like hand out flyers for like new shows, like whatever was on before Gossip Girl, I can't even remember. Or we dressed up in like these green CW t-shirts and we were the street team and we would do all these things. So I met her and I'm telling you this because, and this is in college, this is like sophomore, junior year of college. And it's just to be like in the mix because you don't know. It wasn't in a classroom. Carissa also majored in communications. We never met in class. She worked at the rival bar that I did. We never, like, we kind of knew each other, kind of didn't. But this stupid internship brought us together. And next thing I know, she's telling me as we become friends, hey, I work at, the, she's from, she was from Missouri. And she was, I work at the local radio station and I'm actually getting promoted and my spot, my crappy little spot is going to be up. Like, do you want to do it? Like, I'll put in a good word for you. And I was like, what? How is that? So this incredible woman who is getting, a, 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 you know, ahead of me decides to reach down and pull me up. I don't know if I've ever really given her enough love for that, but she did. And then I walked into a, a local radio station during college and was told, do you ask, do you know about country music? This is a country music station. And I was like, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I said, yes, I agree. Yes, I guess I did. I mean, what, what am I not going to learn it? Of course I will. So then I said, yes, I got the job. And I spent like every weekend making no money, but working midnight to 6 a.m. or two to six in the afternoon or whatever it was by myself in this radio station, learning and, you know, really getting that experience of like, let me, t every break was an opportunity. And I, there were so few. You worked a six hour shift and you got like three minutes on the air total. That's like, that's it. Everything else was like Maroon 5 is playing and like Taylor Swift is playing and you have no time. But you, every break was an opportunity to get better. And you can't get that experience in a classroom and you can't get that experience. So um, one thing led to another and that's truly how it happened. It was me knowing somebody and then somebody within that place working in sports and saying, Hey, you're not a free, you, like you're, you're talking shit. Like come in here and get on the radio in the middle of the night and do that. And I was like, okay, sure. And that's how it happened. Well, throughout your early years in the industry, were there any pivotal moments that either taught you anything or challenged you for the better? Oh my gosh, all of them, probably the no's the most, right? Like the yeses weren't that tough and you didn't, you don't stop to think about them as much. It is the the struggle of having the door not opened for you when you're walking around St. Louis in the cold and you haven't slept because you did a Cardinal shift uh, at the stadium. And then you have a Nick's pub shift from 5 p.m. to 5 in the morning. That was the shift, a bar that allowed cigarette smoking crazy. So fun though. So fun. And you <laughs> We're like, how do I, how do I make it be okay with this to support myself while I have a bigger dream? And my bigger dream, I don't like. I was kind of fuzzy. I think I really wanted to be like on E News. That was something that I, like I wanted to do pop culture. It seemed easy. It seemed light. It seemed like something I'd be so natural at. Um, but the nos, the nos that I get going to like the local NBC KSDK affiliate in downtown St. Louis and trying to get into anyone that would let me create can you shoot can you produce edit yeah sure you know all those things and trying to get someone to listen to you and it's the no's and then when you finally get a yes it's like you, it, it means so much more but i would say not get you know the, the lesson in that is just not giving up and it's such a trite thing to say but it's you know what you want people will help you but nobody cares as much as you do and that's it so there's there was very little in my 20s complaining about that. It was all just, no, no one's going to care as much as I do. I have to go knock on these doors and get as many no's and get as many you're crazies and get as many as, you know, you're not the look, you're not pretty enough. You're not this enough to, to sort of be like, all right, I'm going to make it happen. Well, throughout some of those yeses, you've been heavily involved in fantasy football throughout your career. Sirius XM's live in the fantasy and fantasy drive and fantasy zone on direct TV. What about fantasy football specifically appeals to you so much? I'm competitive by nature. I like, <laughs> I like that. I enjoy that. I have, I have an older brother. Um, 
and he's sort of why I started to love football. We'd watch, you know, Matt Forte and Devin Hester do their thing in Chicago. And it was, uh, you know, football was a real way to sort of escape so, sort of this pocket of Polish culture that we had. That was when I say like it was it was it was I might as well have been living in Warsaw growing up. It was Polish food, Polish language disrespectful to talk to my mom in English, barely did, still barely do, really don't speak to my mother in English. Um, you know, Polish church, Polish bank, Polish deli, Polish, everyone's speaking the language, everyone's in, into their sauce. Um, soccer was it, right? So like, you know, to sort of assimilate to uh, where we, you know, where we went to school, which was not in our neighborhood, not in our, we, we, we went, to, you know, we had, I was very lucky to have a diverse education uh, with Chicago public schools growing up. Um, you know, football's king, right? Even then, even with a crappy team. So, so we would always watch um, and, and do all of that. And my brother and I naturally are competitive and we got into fantasy football and it was just easy for me. And I thought it was so cool then that I knew about the other players and everyone in this, you know, this, was, this wasn't when I was like 12, this was when I was older, but then you, you have a leg up on anyone who's just, and at the time there wasn't like Twitter. So you didn't know what was going on, you know, with Arian Foster, this was before then. So like, but to know like who Sean Alexander was and know all about him or LaDainian Tomlinson and know any, any of that, even like Peyton Hillis, I remember whatever it was, uh, was cool. And I, I, I don't like math even. I, I don't like numbers. So it's nothing to do with that. It was about co competition. Well, I, I love the Devin Hester shout out. Always a Miami hurricane. Uh, yes! through and through. So every, everything and all your stops led up to Good Morning Football, where you hosted for six years on NFL Network every weekday. How did that opportunity come about? So I was working at the time at NBC Sports. Um, I had weaseled my way uh, onto a couple of programs. I was brought there to NBC to do radio hits by myself in a radio booth in a silly little phone booth studio in the middle of Times Square alone. I remember getting there and being like, oh, this isn't gonna work because I don't see anybody. How do I get anywhere? How do I, you know, how am I, how can I be crafty here? And so I would find reasons to go up to Stanford. Uh, so it's a train ride, a Metro North ticket, which was like 15 bucks. It was a lot of money to go to go up there and back, but I'd find ways to, to get up there and be like, oh, I'm here to talk to HR, but I'd really be peeking around like, you know, where can I go? And I was already obsessed with fantasy football. So Roto World was the natural go. Like I was like, I need to work for Roto World. That would be that would that was my dream. My dream at that point was like, can I work at Roto World, the biggest, most successful, most important, relevant fantasy football operation out there? Um, and they were nice enough to give me a shot to do some things. I said that I was I convinced them I know nothing about this. I'm like, you guys need video content. This website needs to be more dynamic. I don't even know if they worked or whatever, but but uh, but they let me do that, and I would pull Evan Silva on from his house wherever he was living. I think in Chicago at the time, and make him talk to me, and I'd make. Um, you know, Patrick Doherty, who's now, you know, a force in his own right, Adam Levitan, all those guys, I'd make them talk to me. And they had a sponsorship um, deal with Yahoo. So Brad Evans and, and all of those guys, Brandon Funston, Andy Barons, um, still, all, still honestly, some of my favorite people. And we had a good thing going. And it was, you know, it's hard to get the people who make decisions in any big company to see the value in something like a fantasy football or a newfound thing. Like now look at sports betting, what I do on FanDuel TV, like still there's resistance, even though you're seeing how quickly that is, is changing. It's being featured on Sunday night football. It's being featured everywhere. There's, you know, massive sponsorships and uh, integration. So I looked at fantasy football like that. I said, I, this fantasy football needs to be on Sunday night football on NBC. Like, how can we push that? That was my goal to be able to be that person. But I was doing, you know, I was chipping away and I felt good about that. All of us were on the Roto World side, chipping away at that when an opportunity presented itself um, with a, a man named Michael Davies, who was the executive producer who wants to be a millionaire, brought that to the United States. Of course, now is the EP on Jeopardy. And he has a, a production company called Embassy Row. And he somehow, this British man who is that, that's who I'd love to interview. He somehow convinced NFL media to get rid of their morning show or move on from it or evolve it in a way and give him, him who does not know football at all, him who I met at NBC. The other football. Yeah. The other, he doesn't, but he does not know American football. Uh, nearly as well, but but was captivated by it, wanted to make a difference in how it was viewed in the U.S. and, and got them to give him a chance. And it's it, it's really re brilliant and remarkable. And he knew me from what I had been doing at NBC, though on a smaller microscope. You know, Mike Florio would like send me out at Super Bowls to you know do, do his 
his work for his show, the, those producers. Um, but I loved my time at NBC. Matt Casey's uh, a, a really wonderful producer. He's phenomenal. And I would do about anything to work with him again. He's probably, one of, he's probably my favorite producer I've ever had. And he's still over there. Um, you know, he's worked his way up, of course, to an incredible and prolific career with Sunday Night Football in that package. Uh, but I got this sort of, you know, would you, let's get you out of this deal and get you to NFL Network to do the morning show. And I was like, Michael, I was obsessed with NFL Network like obsessed. Like I would watch Inside Training Camp Live and be like, oh my God, how do they do this? How are they jumping from one place to another? And this is so incredible. And the Didi King Cabal, and I was obsessed with Andrew Siciliano. and was like, he's so brilliant and he's so smooth and great. And I was such a big fan of it that it wasn't even a question of no. no I was like dying to do it. Imagine. And then I got to give, you know, Mark Quinzel gets all the credit in the world. He's run stuff over at, um, at NFL for so long and he gave me a shot and he said, he had never met me, never heard of me. I had to fly to LA to meet him. I was so nervous. Oh my God, I was so nervous. Because he could just say, no, I don't know you. We have a million people. Yeah. And then at the end of it, we were talking about Coldplay. And some that's all I remember, talking about Coldplay. And he said, all right, let's see how this goes. And there go the next six years. Well, real quick, favorite Coldplay song? Oh my gosh, there's too many. First you one. Know, like I I flew to Peru to see them on my birthday. Like that's how much I love wow. them. Oh, yeah, I'm a big. It's one of my biggest hobbies, traveling to see music. I would say Sparks. Good choice. Good choice. Mm -hmm. So throughout the six years at NFL Network and Good Morning Football, how do you think you developed uh, your skills throughout those years? On the fly, I built an airplane while I was flying. That's what it felt like. Okay. And looking looking back at it, when it slows down there's more gratitude I think in it, but it was such a whirlwind. It was, cr I think the first three years I didn't sleep is what I felt. And it looks like it too. Like I'll look back and lives and be like, Oh my God. Um, I developed my skills with experience on the air. I've never been, like I said, cameras have never, I'm not, not flustered, but I, at a certain point, something happened where I was just like, I can handle anything could happen right now. And that's a really brilliant skill that you truly cannot develop unless you're in live fire, live bullets. And almost everything has happened. The unfortunate human occurrence of death has happened while I was on the air. Coaches getting fired, big things happening, mega trades out of nowhere. Uh, and that I'm obsessed with. That feeling is the best feeling. And the responsibility that the four of us had in setting the tone for the morning and the rest of the NFL world, the responsibility we had to get it right every morning. I know it's, it seems like a lot of fun and games, but I was always, uh, I was always really interested in that. But you develop it, you know, just by reps. There's no, there. I've done so much live TV. It's crazy. You think three hours a day, five days a week, it's kind of bananas, but I love it. It's it just, it becomes natural, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I want to pivot away for a second and, and ask you about your role as host of People, the TV show. Was there always, and, and I know you mentioned earlier that you always saw yourself on, on E! News and doing pop culture. Yeah. But was, the, was the itch getting even bigger to try something outside of sports and more in the entertainment news cycle? You know, I remember seeing Michelle Beadle, who when she was on Sports Nation, like there was no, uh, there was, it was her. Like I, my eyes were like, oh my God, I'm in love with her. Like I loved her. And she, when she was at NBC and we, um, we were there sort of at the same time. And I was this little speck, little speck. And she was the, the star that they had brought in. She was so nice, cool to me. She was so freaking cool to me all the time. She'd let me come on her show. She had a show. She didn't know. Let me come on her show. I got my first reps. She made me super nervous, but she was great. But she had a deal with like Access Hollywood too. And I loved seeing, I was like, oh, that's really cool. Because like that's in my head, I'm like, well, I love sports, but like I would love to do that. And then so when I find, so I'd done a couple of little things for like E! News along the way. The people opportunity, I loved the executive producer. And that's why I took it. It was such an easy thing to add another full-time job to my three hour a day show. I mean, it's crazy. I would leave Good Morning Football at 10 Eastern and be there by 11 in a totally different kind of hair and makeup. Like we're talking crazy ponies and like like just crazy, you know, just a totally different look, which is so fun. Um, but then you'd be there till four or five at night, you know, so that was every that was every day. Yeah. Uh, and I there were two reasons I took it. The executive producer, Rob Silverstein, was somebody who who 
breathed so much life into into me with that and thought right away knew he wanted me and I loved that. And he said he'd make me better and he did because it's really hard to get producers in this day and age to stop and make you better. It's hard to, it's hard, it's just hard. He was yeah. that, he made me better. Matt Casey, the other guy I mentioned, also made me better. Um, and I'm just giving shout outs and love to everyone. Everybody, I'm just going to, I'm just As you it. should. I, really, I used to not, I used to not let it, I'm just letting it fly these days. We can get into why, I don't even know why, and you can shrink me, I'm just being honest. Um, and the other reason was I really wanted to work on something that I spotted as a bit of a weakness uh, in my game, and that was interviewing. Only because I don't, I didn't really get to do it a lot. So like yeah. on, we had a daily show, three hours, but any guest that would come on, you know, the interviews immediately split four ways. There's no chemistry that really can happen when you're having a conversation because you're not allowed to naturally follow up. And so I'm like, am, am I a good interviewer? I don't even know. I don't even know. But if you take the job with people, it's you and George Clooney. It's you and this person. And I took it in the middle of the pandemic, knowing like a lot of that would be on Zoom or whatever. But I wanted to hone in and really work on those interview skills, which then when I asked NFL Network to let me in on their Sunday game day morning show to do the Mahomes and the Rogers and the Sean Payton's and those big interviews, I wanted to be ready for those and knock them out. And People Magazine gave me that. And I loved, I loved that opportunity for that. I'll tell you though, Michael, you know, like when you always like think you want something and you're like, okay, and then you get it and you're like, oh no, why? Like, like it didn't, that's sort of the entertainment news situation to me. Like it was not the itch got scratched right away. And I was like, oh, this isn't nearly as challenging, compelling. Sports is where it's at. Sports it, is. It, it, it filled your yeah. appetite. Yeah. It didn't fill my appetite, actually. It was like, oh, this is what I wanted. But it's like, I'm asking about what they're wearing, or I'm asking about things okay. that like, whereas in sports, it's like, oh my God, you gave everything from when you were four for this. Like what, and the drama's bigger and it's more, there's more gravity to it. That's not to like put down entertainment, entertainment news or anything. But to me, sports just, I have a different level of passion for it. And I realized that when I took the people job. So as mentioned, you're at NFL Network and Good Morning Football for six years. Up until this past September, when you joined FanDuel and launched your own show, Up in Adams, on FanDuel TV. Why was it the right time for you to move on to a new challenge? I feel like I had done such good work at Good Morning Football. My contract was up a year before I left. And there was an option that was discussed. And I said, okay, I'll come back for the year. But then it was sort of, we know we're going our separate ways, but not our separate ways. We know that I'm leaving Good Morning Football. That was sort of, there was the NFL media part is something that I miss today. Like I want to be with NFL media. Mm -hmm. um, good Morning Football, I just felt like I had done really good work there. And it's, a, you know, I won an Emmy on the way out the door. What else can I say, Michael? Like we, we, we did that. So it was time, it was time to move on uh, and it felt right. And it was right. It was the right move to do. Um, and it didn't matter like what other options I had. There was like a countdown to me leaving. And then while that was happening, we were talking about what I could still do with NFL media. And then things as they always do get sticky with like rules and precedent and, you know, snail paced change. Yeah, I get that. When, when people sit down to watch the new show Up and Adams, what do you want them to take away from the show? Oh, Michael, thank you for asking that. Uh, Up and Adams is an ever changing hour. Uh, it's on FanDuel TV. It's sort of a lone wolf. We have a couple of other shows and programs, but it sort of lives on Twitter. We put clips out, they go off or they don't. And it's that's our audience. My audience is one that I always want to engage with. So to me, what I want people who watch the show, if they were to watch it start to finish, it's on YouTube, of course, every day after we air. Uh, information today, you know, there's four teams left. We had four of the best voices covering those teams on my show. That's important to give the Marissa Contepelli's, um, uh, the, the John Clark legend in Philadelphia. Uh, maybe, maybe I can amplify him a little, a little bit more because I have a more of a national reach on television. Um, and to get their information is really important. So I want some, everyone to leave well informed and entertained. And my favorite thing to do is honestly to interview. So I've loved having the, the, the we, today was actually our hundredth show, which is crazy. Congratulations. So, 
thank you. So we, you know, we're a small team. It's a startup. I love building new things. It's a lot of fun. It's like a pain in the ass, but it's so fun. And we, uh, we've had like, you know, we've had all the famers. We've had the Chris Carters. We've had the Chris Collinsworth. We've had the, you know, Sean Payton was my first guest. He gave me, he gave me an entire hour. You know, you have guys who are willing to come on every week. Like Gronk's like, sure, I'll come on. I'm like, Gronk, you don't have to, like, he'll, he'll come on. Or um, Mark Ingram or Cam Jordans or all, like all of these these guys, you know, Jordan Spieth randomly, like just random people uh, and and showing a little bit of a different side of them or getting something out of them or just having fun and learning about them. Like curiosity, I think really drives me. And so scratching that itch is something that I want people to sort of see and feel when they leave the show. Maybe like, oh, I don't know if I like loved Chris Carter or like something you said about that, but now I see his point. Like that makes me happy, if that makes sense. What, what's your behind the scenes preparation for the show? You know, it, because it's daily, do you have a daily routine? Does it change each day? Yeah, I think it's both. You know, I'm, I'm with a very hungry team right now. So while the shout outs keep going, I'll, uh, I'll give shout outs to my senior producer, Richard Isakow, um, Conrad Company, my, my line producer. We have uh, Marissa McBride. We have Taylor Few, who runs all the social. She's the breath of our show. Brian Bart and Matthew Hamilton. So Matthew Hamilton came with me from Good Morning Football. He's my life force. Like He is such a good brain when it comes to football. We work together really well. He comes on the air a lot on on Up and Adams, and he's always available. So I'm I'm indebted to him. Like he's incredible. So that's the team. Like that's literally it. So I would say we don't have a newsroom like we did at Up and Adams, right? So you're you know Hamilton and I were just talking about this. We're like sifting through press conferences instead of somebody in an NFL newsroom giving us the beats. You know, giving yeah. us the, the most important parts. Um, so, so workflow, we're still working out sort of, but it, it's a daily show. I'm, it's hard. It's hard. Like it's, every, it's all day. It's all day, every day. They work their asses off and we sort of decide what, what are the most important things in the show. It's so guest driven, which is so fun that we sort of work around that too. Like even now before we hopped on and I was talking to you, it's who can we get Monday? Well, we have an ask out to Chris Collinsworth. We have an ask out to Tori Smith because he can, of course, talk Niners. He can talk Eagles. He could talk, okay, like we, you know, like we make these decisions on who can we get on our show? Who do we want to ask to be on our show? And then you sort of work it from there. So we, we of course, know Monday we're going to react to what happened Sunday. So if the Bengals lose, are we going to want a Bengals player? If Lane Johnson wins, we have a pretty good connect to Lane Johnson. Will he pop on and say hi? And then you build around that. But it's basically, you know, the off season is going to be the real the real party because God, God knows what we'll do. I want to thank FanDuel, though, because I got to tell you, like, they're not a content company. They're not a media company. They're just bought a network. They're turning into that. And the leeway that they have given me and the trust that they've given me to say, like, here's your hour. Do whatever you want with it. Like, not whatever you want, of course, but really, like, go at it. That's so – I don't know if you – like, it's so not – not the standard like it's so yeah. absolutely not the standard and you can kind of see like and you know based on mcafee and fanduel's relationship like you know Ma fanduel is supportive a lot of leeway a lot of you know a lot of room to express yourself um i just choose to express myself with bringing moments out in other people i guess i like interviewing i like giving my takes too michael but i also I'm not the kind of person who's like, let me tell you what you need to hear about this. Like, I don't have it in me to hog a, to be on the mic for like an hour just talking about what I think about something. I'd much rather like hear what somebody else says and then follow up with them. So you've worked all over the place. You've worked in both New York and Los Angeles. It's time for you to settle the debate right here, right now. Which city are you taking and take all the factors into consideration? Zimmerman. I yes. cannot handle Los Angeles. Really? I was not okay. built for, where are you? I'm in New Jersey, so I'm a New York guy. New Jersey. Okay, great. So Jer Jersey's great. I, when I moved to New York, I lived in, I was on my best friend's couches in Metuchen, New Jersey. And I would take, um, That's right. I would take. Close to me. Yeah, Metuchen, Unionville. Um, I know Clark really well. I've got, I've got Colonia. I've got friends in Colonia, New Jersey that I, I literally would be like, I'm bumming on your couch until I find an apartment. Um, it's just not, for, it's just, it's a tougher adjustment. Like, I feel like I can be thrown into the fire. I'm fine. I'm cool with anywhere, but living in LA is just not for me. I, I don't, I don't like the inconvenience of things. I like to walk out my door and be able to have coffee on my left and, a, you know, whatever I need a bodega, um, on my right. So people wise, 
I honestly have been working so, so, so much and focused on the show and getting it off the air and, you know, ordering those parts for the plane that I'm building in the air while I'm building it that I haven't like really experienced maybe LA, but okay. it's not for me. I was in New York last week and I was like, oh no, I'm coming home for sure. There you go. I like that. Well, I, I want to mm-hmm. wrap up by kind of looking ahead a bit. I think someone like you who is so ambitious, always wants to do more. Is there anything you'd like to accomplish in your career that you haven't yet? A bucket list dream, uh, you know, whether it's in or out or sports. Yeah. Hmm. I would love to do something with, this sounds crazy, like a vintage, vintage clothing, like vintage NFL logo clothing. Like there's a lot of clothes out there for NFL fans not so much my style, great, but not my style. So like something that would be more androgynous, I would love to sort of be a part of. I was working on something a couple of years ago and it got away from me, unfortunately. So um, I need to just be more focused on that. And I would say media wise, I'm really focused on, I think you heard me. I'm just so, I want to like crush Super Bowl. That is my, that's my visualization every day. Just, I want my team to feel like they knocked it out of the park. I want great guests, but the guests don't, you know, there's great guests everywhere all over Super Bowl. Right now, I really want to make my show solid. Like I want my show to be solid all around. So I'm actually don't have my future ideas put together. Like I've always had those, those notions. It's no secret that I want to be on like, you know, that big desk, that eyes and desk. Um, but I also, am not going to wait for it to happen. You know what I mean? Like it, it, I don't know. I don't, you know, I actually don't, I don't know. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't know if it's going to happen. I'd love for it to, but I'm more focused on what I'm doing right now, which is a very new K thing. Like I'm always on to the next in personal life in professional life. And, and I think pandemic really did a number on me where I'm more mm-hmm. present. That's good. And if you do bring a vintage clothing, please bring back the Jets logo. Um, okay. You know, that that's well, all I'm asking. You like that one? Hey, what do you think of the Jets? Do you want Brady? Like, what's the story? I mean, with Hackett now on board, I guess it's Rogers. Rogers? Okay, but Rogers couldn't get him... Like Rogers, no, not, like you can get Rogers last year. I'm not saying I want him. I'm just saying it's very likely. I I, w- I would love a Derek Carr. You're Me not gonna too. have to give up. You're not gonna have to give up a lot to get him. I don't think you're just gonna have to take on the contract. Um, but I love I, Derek Carr. I don't know what happens like with I mean the hack at the Russell Wilson of it all. Like it's all in, everything's insane. Yeah, I, th- there's a lot of moving parts, and, and seeing now Lafleur back with McVay, it's it's almost like well. Did we let him go too early? If McVay sees something in him, I don't know. There, there's just there's so much negativity with Jets fans that I I can't see any positives right now. So I'm just it's it's a wait and see. Everything just, everything else around the quarterback position is good, but yeah. that's kind of the linchpin. If Aaron didn't go to Denver when Hackett was the head coach, they had a projected top five offense and defense. Why would he now go to the Jets where he's not yeah. even the head? in charge i don't know you know hackett and hackett and sala know each other from jacksonville yeah and i also know woody johnson loves the big name so i wouldn't be surprised if brady's name was being thrown around but i I can't i i i can't do that that. you have to hate brady don't you i despise him i despise him i i don't like the buccaneers just because of him once you know once he leaves i'll i won't have a problem with the bucks but yeah it's it's not a good relationship between Jets fans and Brady, and and yeah. I don't think him coming would would help it out at all. I'm, I think I'm going to um, that eighty for Brady movie premiere. It's a very Hollywoody thing to do. I think I'm yeah. going to go. I'll tell him that Michael Zimmerman from the Athletic said he hates you. Please do, and, and also say hi to Jane Fonda for me, would you? I love Jane Fonda. I hope I see Gronk there. It actually would be really fun. Maybe that'll get me to like LA, being in that crowd of people. Okay. All right. I'll, well, tell, I'll, tell, I'll tell Jay Fonda you say what's up, though. I'll tell her. Please do. Please do. Well, you can watch Kay every weekday on Up and Adams at 11 a.m. Eastern and 8 a.m. Pacific on FanDuel TV. Thank you so much, Kay, for taking the time to talk. Really appreciate it and hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you.